Hi, welcome to this session overview to HR analytics. As professionals, you have signed up for this program. However, I have come across different HR professionals who have some of these questions in their mind. First, they say HR is all about feelings and emotion. What has numbers got to do with that? Can you even measure feelings? Then, we are taught that each employee is unique. He or she has their own choices. But analytics tells us that we would be able to quantify, build a model of their behavior and then predict when they will leave, when they will stay with us. Is that even possible? If you are like me, having spent a few years in the function, you have developed your original insight in terms of how things happen, how people behave and what actions can be taken. Now somebody tells us that an algorithm can actually do as good a job as how we are doing with our ingrained wisdom. How is that possible? And even if we agree to all the three, we still think that analytics is something that is being done in companies in technology who have access to the tools. But can it be done by anybody working in an average organization? Or is analytics meant for HR at all? Especially when we hear these words. Yes, visualization is something that we understand. We have even come across once in a while the word called algorithm, but not in a HR sphere. We get predictive analytics, the word, you know, something which you're able to use analytics to predict the future. And then we are faced with big data. Now we know there is data. There may be a small Excel sheet or a big SAP file. But what is small data and what is big data? We know scientists. What is a data scientist? What kind of research does somebody do with data? Analytics people you meet keep talking about R. Now, R is just one alphabet out of 26. So why is it so significant in the world of analytics? And more dangerously, there is a talk of Python. Now, Pythons are very dangerous for people. Why should HR professionals adapt Python to serve people better? This and more questions come to our mind. In this section, what we will do is to talk through the evolution of HR analytics as it has been happening for more than 40 years now. The technology trends that have accelerated the adoption of HR analytics in the form of the analytics wave. Then we'll spend a little time on how different businesses are leveraging and benefiting from the power of analytics. Take a strategic view of HR and see what the business is expecting from HR. And finally, how some companies are using analytics to meet these expectations successfully. First, let me talk about the evolution of HR analytics. The Hawthorne study, which connected the changes in the work environment with employee motivation, is one of the earliest examples of behavioral research. We use instruments like FIRO, Bellbean team profiling or Big Five personality tests. All these are statistically validated. So the outcome is reliable. Geert Hofstede set up a personal research department in IBM as far back as the 1960s. He used this to research how employees from different cultures operate in an organization and came out with the cultural dimensions theory. We typically use processes for setting goals, rewarding and recognizing employees, and identify the unique knowledge and skills required for high performance. All these, in turn, can be traced back to pioneering research, which set up a model, which in turn got converted into processes, which are widely used by companies. In other words, HR is based on well-researched principles. Each profession needs its pioneers. HR analytics may be a word which is more common today, when it started, it was HR measurement and HR metrics. Dr. Fitzins published the measurement imperative in 1978. He also set up the Saratoga Institute in 1980 to develop and benchmark metrics in HR. He also pioneered a list of 30 metrics that can be used by any company to measure its effectiveness and efficiency. He has remained active and pioneered HCM21 for the 21st century, which is the predictive strategic human capital system. Dr. John Sullivan is another pioneer in HR metrics. 
He is a prolific author and speaker. He specializes more in talent acquisition. He also teaches in the San Francisco State University on HR, measurement, talent acquisition and related subjects. In 1995, Mark Huslid published his research on the strategic impact of high performance work systems. This research found that there is a tangible impact on business performance from HR policies and practices. And this was to the tune of one sigma. You know, what is one sigma? Sigma is standard deviation. And we will spend a little more time on that in the next few sessions. Interestingly, they also found that this is not like a panacea, that they use one set of practices and the business performance improves. They found actually it is more unique to an organization depending on their culture and the business environment. A lot of us are aware of Gallup's Q12, a set of 12 questions that predict employee engagement. Now, Gallup's Q12 is not again common sense, but actually they researched more than 30 years of data, hundreds of thousands of data elements to identify the top 12 which actually have an impact on employee engagement. In 1998, Sears, the retail firm, published its model called as the Employee Customer Profit Chain, which essentially Sears looked at what impact will creating a compelling place to work have. And they found that an employee behavior is influenced by what he or she thinks about the job as well as what they think about the company. If the employee behavior is positive, it translates into being helpful to the customers and also improve their ability to sell high-value merchandise to the customers. When the employee is helpful, the customer is happy. So he or she keeps coming back to see us and they also make recommendations to their friends and others, which in turn should lead to revenue growth and improvement in operating margin. This may sound empirical, but the magic was CS were able to trace it back and say a 5% increase in employee attitude delivers a 1.3% increase in customer satisfaction, which in turn can get converted into a 0.5% increase in revenue growth. Next were a couple of important books which came up in this century. The first was the HR scorecard. In the 1990s, the balance scorecard concept was created, which essentially said it is not enough just you measure the outcomes like revenues, perform revenue, profitability, but you also need to look at indicators which are leading and lagging, which we'll again spend some time later to understand. And there needs to be a structured way of looking at the business performance. The HR scorecard derives from that and it is structured into learning, HR process, internal customers and financial measures. Put together represents the strategic view of the HR and organization and how it is contributing to business. Sports, in a lot of ways, is similar to HR. You get a set of people and you leverage their talent. The more you are able to leverage their talent, the more successful your team is. Moneyball, written by Michael Lewis, helped create the analytics wave. He found out how Oakland Athletics baseball team, which was having a very low budget, outperformed much better funded teams by focusing on unconventional analytics called as Sabre metrics. This has strong implications for HR because not every organization has the resources required to hire and retain the best. However, if you are able to use analytics, we should be able to deliver the potential of all the employees and be equally successful. Finally, uh, we are reaching about this decade. Google actually had conducted a multi-year research on what good managers do. In fact, uh, in its growing stages, the companies thought you need program managers and you need individual contributors. So they're not sure what the role of managers was. So they actually let go all their managers. Then they got them back. But they said, you know, not every manager is equal. So we need to research what good managers do. So they did a multi-year research and arrived at eight key behaviors and three pitfalls of managers. This was widely shared in 2011 and has been used as a reference subsequently. And some of the key behaviors they identified were good managers have technical skills to help advise the team. 
they have a clear vision and strategy for the team they are good communicators but listen to the team as well and are very productive and result oriented their pitfalls would be lack of consistent approach to performance management and career development sounds common place to us but this is actually statistically validated using analytics so this is the evolution of hr analytics all the way from 1960s to the current decade we are in how the analytics wave is taking the momentum forward is something that we will see next